is it that everything that's good has to come to an end? You see, one of the worst parts of an amazing game is that feeling in the credits of knowing you'll never get to experience it again. And maybe the most important part of a journey like that is the world. After all, it's the world or universe in a game that determines how deeply we can fall into its grasp. So today, let's take a look at some of the most captivating worlds that have ever been put into games and see what it is that lights the fire in our souls to know what's out there. There really isn't anything else out there quite like Fallout. A lot of other games are part of a genre, but in many ways Fallout is the genre, that being post-apocalyptic hellscapes and games. I love other series too, like Wasteland, but there truly is just something about Fallout specifically that captures an essence unlike anything else. The series takes us across multiple desolate and barren badlands of renowned locations like Washington DC, Las Vegas, Boston, and many more, now all utterly destroyed after the bombs fell. But the thing that really makes Fallout so memorable is how perfectly crafted these worlds are. The originals, that being the isometric Fallout 1 and 2 from the 90s, have a zany sense and violent nature reminiscent of the times, and the newer Bethesda entries have a focus on worlds that beckon you in with immaculate environmental storytelling. For me though, the thing that makes the worlds of Fallout so special is those little stories they tell. Not about grand conspiracies or big plot points, but those smaller stories about humanity and its struggles to survive in a world that's lost everything. You see, in the Fallout universe, maybe its biggest staple is the vaults. Before the bombs fell and nukes were set off across the planet, a company named Vault Tech constructed over 100 vaults that were advertised as a way to protect humanity should Armageddon come in trying times. But the secret alternative motive was that almost all of these vaults were being used to experiment on the human race for some unknown goal. Based on now leaked documents of the original Fallout stories from the primary creators, we know that the vaults were intended to be test sites for powerful governments and people to experiment on the less fortunate, while they lived and traveled across space, free from the destruction of war. Because after all, war, war never changes. And another thing that doesn't change is us. In each of these vaults, we get to uncover strange, otherworldly, and horrifying experiments done to humanity. In Fallout 3, for example, we get to uncover a vault full of nothing but clones of one man named Gary, who scream their name while hunting you down with a knife. And as you travel through this dark abyss, you uncover the corpses of those who tried to fight back against this clone, and a fully barricaded woman's restroom trying to hide from this screaming man. In Fallout New Vegas, you can stumble upon a vault devoid of all life, but slowly uncover through terminals how they were required to sacrifice one person every year, which led to non-stop infighting and turmoil. Or what about the original Fallout, where you can uncover a vault that trapped those inside and pumped endless amounts of radiation into their skulls, turning them into unrecognizable monsters in front of their friends and family. It's the stories like this that make Fallout such a captivating world. Even more than shooting or exploding limbs with systems like VATS, which are great by the way, what makes us remember Fallout is these little stories of humanity fighting back against the odds, of situations that we can only hope we never find ourselves in, and the psychology of seeing what would happen to people when they're pushed to the brink of their existence. And in Fallout's case, it's all about that environmental storytelling, about uncovering what has happened in the world's past. It's the type of storytelling I tend to connect with the most, because putting the pieces together to uncover a mystery is just always exciting. Environments in these games are full of stories on their own, like a little kid's teddy bear left next to a skull chained in a room, or endless amounts of terminal logs to dig through into sadistic companies past. Fallout's a series full of faster moments with big set pieces, but it's also a world defined by those slower moments of just walking around a scene and taking it all in. And it's the series dedication to world building like this, in a world so full of destruction, that makes it amazing. Seeing those bands of humanity that have tried to start and rebuild alongside raider factions that have given up all hope entirely and instead are forced to kill and steal for survival. Oftentimes fantasy worlds try to take us to places better and more fantastical than our very own. But in Fallout's case, it's just the opposite. Instead, we get transported into the worst hells imaginable. 
But maybe there really is something beautiful about exploring an inferno like this. Something that only a game series like Fallout could capture in the worlds they create, and also probably a big reason that so many loved the series in the first place. It allows for dark and interesting decisions, like deciding to drop a nuke on Megaton in Fallout 3, while also leaving room for more poignant stretches of time from people that never lost their sense of humanity even when up against all the odds. And wrapped up in it all is that wacky sense of humor that the series is known for, that creates truly one of the most captivating worlds in all of games, where moment to moment you're quickly moving from feelings of hopelessness, sadness, and anger, to love and grandeur. If you haven't already, do yourself a favor and get immersed into the worlds of Fallout. There seems to be at least something there for everyone, and I can say as someone that doesn't personally like the post-apocalyptic setting all that much, Fallout is able to transcend that feeling and has created some of the most beloved RPGs of all time with storytelling and worlds that last with you for a long time. There's a reason any video like this one would at least mention Fallout and it's because it really is just one of the best and most realized worlds ever put to a game that has spawned an entire fandom eagerly awaiting each new installment. But we're only just getting started, because there's so much more out there too. To this day, I still don't know why more game studios haven't tried to recreate the magic of the Mass Effect series. It's basically the only big AAA sci-fi RPG we have had on this level even over a decade later, and only now with Starfield are we seeing anything even remotely similar in terms of depth, storytelling, and world. What really made Mass Effect such a special series though was the story it told and the characters it introduced to us, all wrapped into one of the greatest sci-fi universes ever crafted even outside of games. Because in each of the Mass Effect games, you get a special roster of different companions that you will get to take on each mission, all of which have their own backstories and quests to uncover, which reveal more about the characters and their desires. For many people, these companions are what they remember most about the series and what made it so great. Characters like Liara, Morden, Garrus, and Rex. But for me, everything Mass Effect is about is the world and the story it told. It's the reason my favorite in the trilogy is the first, and my least favorite is the second, the opposite of most people. And it's because the moments I remember in this series aren't the slower talks with characters. Newer games like Cyberpunk did that better. It's those scenes like when you first take the Normandy to the Citadel, when you first discover the Rachni on Novaria, an icy planet dedicated to top secret research, or unearthing the Thorian on Pharos, an ancient organic plant that has knowledge of an ancient race of aliens who went extinct at the hand of a machine intelligence constructed over a billion years ago by unknown creators. Stories and ideas like this that really capture that childlike imagination in all of us. I can't express how overwhelmed I was as a kid when I first walked through the Citadel in each game. It felt like I was being transported to a new galaxy and really living in it. Each and every planet you can travel to, whether it was on your rover in the first game in Andromeda, or by scanning planets in the second and third installments, gave you a sense that you were part of something so much bigger. And that's one of the most important things a game can do, being memorable. Crafting worlds and universes that actually feel like they exist. Where it feels like even if you are the center of the most important story, there's still an entire set of peoples and places out there with their own problems. Mass Effect accomplished this with things like the Codex, which you could just sit down and listen to for hours about lore and history in the game. I know I certainly did, and it's still to this day the best Codex we've ever seen in a game. And on top of all this, there's so much political and personal intrigue in the series that you can really get immersed into. You can spend countless hours just talking with characters about big events in the game like the Genophage, which resulted in an entire race known as the Krogan slowly dying due to not being able to breed. And then in later installments in the series, you actually get to decide the fate of these races and what will happen in the future. It's a world where you get to not only leave your effect on it, but it also leaves such a lasting effect on you. And more than anything, there really just isn't anything else out there quite like the universe of Mass Effect. It's sci-fi but with a fantastical twist that we often don't see in the genre. Your character can be what is known as a biotic, who have control over Mass Effect fields that can manipulate the environment, essentially making you a Jedi Master. And you also can unlock different guns, ammo types, and armors, all staples of any good RPG. But once again, the heart of this series and what makes the world so special is how fantastic it really all is. To this day, the story told in the original trilogy, and even at least the ideas presented in Andromeda, 
are just amazing. Stories of ancient alien races that purge the galaxy of all life in a goal they see as noble, and countless Lovecraftian side stories of powers being unleashed into a galaxy still only in its infancy. It's the exact kind of stories I personally love, and they are also the stories I point to when I explain to people why I like sci-fi worlds so much more than fantasy in most cases, because they make us think. When you play through Mass Effect, every story or moment that unfolds makes you think about the what ifs, about the questions that define the core of our humanity, and make us ponder the greatest question of all what's out there. And just like many of the best Bethesda games, the music in this series builds on the intrigue and solidifies the world as one of the best ever crafted in games. With handfuls of new and perplexing alien races all with storied paths, with characters that are believable and interesting, and most of all a universe that begs to be explored and understood. You know, for most games I have played, the main driver for me was the story, the characters, or the role playing I got to do in between each mission. But in Mass Effect's case, it was digging deeper and deeper into a universe that had utterly captured my soul. A series that once you play, you won't ever forget about. And one that shows us just how great and how captivating our imaginations can be. Nowadays, the phrase RPG or role-playing game seems to have lost a lot of its original meaning. It used to be in reference to games that focused on choice, consequence, meaningful character design, progression, and dialogue, along with deep systems of combat or world interactability. But for a lot of recent RPGs in our modern era, they play more like an action-adventure title than any of the great role-playing romps of old. Baldur's Gate 3 is one big exception, though, because this game is all about putting the role-playing back in role-playing games, and is shaping up to be a worthy successor to what many consider some of the greatest games of all time in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. These worlds are based on the Dungeons and Dragons Forgotten Realms campaign, and take us on adventures fighting demons, solving puzzles, and crafting our own journeys however we see fit. But you see, the best part about the world of Baldur's Gate 3 specifically isn't the lore or the nice graphics and presentation. If anything, a lot of the tropes in Baldur's Gate are quite generic, with standard orcs, goblins, ogres, trolls, and more. And while it does have now decades of world building from some of the best writers in the industry, the real genius of Baldur's Gate 3 comes from how its world was designed. Each and every encounter you get into in the game is hyper-focused on giving you options, choice, but this time with a real consequence. If you play as a drow in game, you might be able to completely bypass some of the goblin enemies early on because they're so scared of you, but as any other race, you might be met with immediate aggression. As a race of smaller stature, like a gnome, you could stumble upon a small hole leading to a secret underground passage of kids who steal to survive, but as another one of the taller races, you would need to find another way in. If you play as a druid, you can transform into massive and scary spiders, and then go through dialogue as these different monsters, which completely changes how scenes play out and how everyone reacts to you. You can throw a fireball at a web holding a creature up and watch as it falls down a massive hole to its death, after which you can cast Featherfall and have your whole party float down to find it, only to stumble upon an ancient cavern deep underground full of glowing and talking plants. Maybe more than any game world ever, the world of Baldur's Gate 3 actually feels closest to the experience you would truly have at a Dungeons & Dragons table in real life with friends. No matter what insane and wacky ideas you come up with with the tools at your disposal, there's a believable reaction in the world that makes it fun and interactive. Every choice you make in game can drastically affect not only the world around you, but the story that you will tell and the adventure you will go on. No two playthroughs of this game will be the same, and that's not just because of binary dialogue choices that result in one of two outcomes, like most popular RPGs like Mass Effect and Fallout New Vegas. You can do things like steal something off of a counter, which an NPC will then react to, which can spin off an entirely new questline, resulting in things you otherwise would have never seen. It's much more dynamic than any other RPG I've ever played. And that's because choice in Baldur's Gate 3 isn't something presented to you. It's something you create dynamically on the fly, by thinking of different ways to use spells and actions that you have chosen for your character to solve puzzles in infinite amount of ways. It feels more like a theme park, a dungeon master's table, than it does any other game out there. You aren't spoon-fed answers or forced to take specific paths, instead, it feels like a blank easel on which you get to paint your own story. And this only works because of just how reactive and dynamic this world feels, with cutscenes or feedback on every action you take. And that's the key thing that makes the world of Baldur's Gate 3 so captivating. 
I remember a moment at the start of the game when you first wake up on the beach and find one of the NPCs you talked to earlier in the prologue. And if you have a spell that allows you to transform into any of the other races to trick characters, you can transform into a Githyanki, a race she hates, and watch as she starts freaking out about how so many of your kind have been showing up only for you to later reveal it was all a trick the whole time. The game accounts for extremely niche situations like this and even provides entire cutscenes and dialogue to account for it. Now imagine an entire game that takes hundreds of hours to fully complete where you get moments like this the entire way through. To me, maybe more than any other game on this list, this is the type of world that video games should be all about and strive to be. Because even though I tend to enjoy sci-fi and less generic universes or stories, a world that radically realizes you and feels this alive can't be beat. Outer Wilds is one of the most enchanting experiences in a game well ever. And while I personally have a gripe with some of the design decisions of this cult classic that many others see as perfection, I can't deny that the world on offer here, the story it tells, and how its mysteries and secrets slowly unravel before your very eyes, result in an unforgettable experience that every gamer should give themselves the pleasure of at least trying. And that's because the world of Outer Wilds is the most unique I've ever seen in a video game. At the start you awake on a small planet home to strange aliens that you call friends. And slowly you uncover that you're trapped in a never ending cycle where every 22 minutes your local sun goes supernova and wipes out everything you know and love, only for you to awake again and do it all over. The real brilliance of Outer Wilds though, is how you slowly bit by bit, one 22 minute run after another, uncover the secrets behind this beautiful and immaculate world and why everything is happening. Every time you step into that spaceship and first launch into the sky, you're going on yet another adventure into the great unknown. You might stumble across a planet whose entire inside is a hollow nothingness of quantum infinity. You might find a planet that is slowly being swallowed whole by a black hole as you try to traverse its wobbly foundations. Or you might even just come upon a man in the furthest corners of the galaxy sitting back and playing his banjo well aware of the ruin that awaits him, but accepting that fate and leading with optimism in the face of utter death. The real twist of this world though, and what makes it so great, is that as time passes on each of these runs, you slowly uncover the secrets of the universe. Time passes and things change. Going to one planet at the start of the 22 minute cycle might result in you finding some doors or hidden passageways that later in the cycle get covered up with mounds of sand and debris from another nearby planet. Certain areas can unlock or become closed off with time, and even more so, solving many of the puzzles requires you having a fundamental grasp of that one concept. And at any time you can simply get in your spaceship, take off, and go anywhere in your small little galaxy. It's that freedom to forge and piece together the journey on your own terms, and the agency you have in each decision you get to make that makes every playthrough feel like its own. One of the most memorable moments for me on my first playthrough was seeing something behind a massive sheet of ice on a comet I had just parked my ship on. Realizing that based on its orbit around the sun on the galaxy map, maybe I could sit and wait until it passed the sun partway through the cycle. And lo and behold when I did, something beautiful happened. The ice melted away and I sunk into the hidden abyss in the middle of this massive rock. And inside here I slid through ice tunnel after ice tunnel, probably millions of years old, to finally uncover one of the grand secrets and reveals of this game that helped lead me to uncovering even more after I died in an inferno at the end of that run. That's what Outer Wilds is all about. A lot of other worlds and games, especially the open world ones, like to brag about how they have so many different things to discover and search around for in the environment. But maybe more than any other game I've played, Outer Wilds actually lives up to that promise. My main issue with it is that it wasn't dynamic enough and it was all pre-planned. However, that first run through the game without knowing that plan is such a magical experience. Finding out the secrets of an ancient alien race called the Nomai that harness powers that are difficult to even fathom. Slowly solving puzzle after puzzle until you unearth the secrets that seemed impossible for you to do when you first started playing. All to the backdrop of a universe that sits so silent yet does not stand still. It's a game world that begs for you to master it, to learn each and every part of it, to discover what's out there and be rewarded for it. If you like discovery, intrigue, and a story told in your own mind, then Outer Wilds might just have one of the most captivating worlds ever put in a game. So do yourself a favor, and if you haven't yet, 
play what might just be your favorite game of all time. Because even if you end up thinking it could have been so much more like I did, you will surely get lost in a world born out of beauty. Cyberpunk 2077 is my personal favorite game of all time. And I know that probably has a lot of you scratching your heads or angrily running to the comments section. But you see, I don't love Cyberpunk because of the crowd and police AI that had to be updated. I don't love Cyberpunk for the amazing graphics or fun gameplay or choices that quite frankly lacked in meaningful consequence and the bugs that riddle the game at release. I love it for something a lot deeper than that. Because for me, the best worlds out there are built on meaning on characters that last with you, on worlds that feel deep, and on questions that cannot go unanswered. And while I've played games that have better role-playing mechanics, or games that were more polished with less bugs and missing features, I don't think I've ever played a game that ever made me feel quite like this one did when the credits finally rolled. Cyberpunk 2077 isn't a story about fame, fortune, and the fast life. It's a game about the antithesis to all of that. In a world full of gangs, violence, deceit, and destruction, the the story of this game is about finding a solace in all that, and every part of this world falls into full service of that one goal. You can find broken souls grieving things they have done like Barry the cop before he inevitably takes his life. You get to experience characters who previously were wary of you open up about the pains of lost loved ones and the dreams that have passed them by. The reason Cyberpunk is such an amazing world is because more than any game out there, it really is a reflection of our very own. Oftentimes we strive for things in our real lives that don't actually matter, about hitting those goals like becoming the best in all of Night City, only to later in life realize that it was those that we held close around us that mattered most. Something each and every ending to Cyberpunk teaches you in harrowing ways of its own, either with a beautiful send off holding the one you love venturing into your doom, or clawing away at your own mind in a pit of despair after leaving everyone else behind. When you drive around the world in Cyberpunk, Punk, most of what you see is sad and dejected people, tall and imposing buildings, and gangs and all-out warfare. But as you dig deeper into this setting, into this world, as you travel between each and every little back alley, shop, and open market, you start to discover what really makes it so great. The people, the story, the characters, and the meaning behind it all. The AI in the game isn't as good as Red Dead Redemption, the police chases aren't as fun as Grand Theft Auto, and the choice and consequence during quests doesn't even hold a candle to something like Baldur's Gate or The Witcher. But nonetheless, the world of cyberpunk has something special about how it makes you feel. Sometimes I would just stop my car on the side of the road and look up into the sky, into those massive mega structures housing hundreds of thousands of people. I would slowly walk down each different side street in every district on the map and see the love and care that went into this game. Like listening to the sounds of the hustle and bustle and people chatting as you walk through the gardens in the downtown city plaza, or listening to the sounds of birds in the walled off sanctuaries. The hum of machinery just outside the city in the Biotechnica flats that supply food for everyone. It's slower moments like this that define the world of cyberpunk. The quest where instead of combat, you simply take a dip into a local lake and scuba dive with Judy, or listen to Cary Eurodyne play his new song on a boat crashing against the waves, listening to Johnny Silverhand spill out his heart and soul in the middle of a desolate oil field. That's what cyberpunk's all about. Where most games focus on the big set pieces, the bombastic moments, and the flair of it all, something cyberpunk surely has too, what the real core of this game is are those moments where it all just melts away. And that's why cyberpunk relates so much to our own world too. You don't remember a trip because of the beach or the beautiful view, you remember it because of how it made you feel. The people you were with at the time, and the moments you shared with them and yourself that left a mark on the man or woman you've become. The world of Cyberpunk 2077 is a world that captures these moments. The moments that actually matter, and the ones that last with us for a lifetime. The questions that stick in our heads, characters that forge themselves into our hearts, and a journey that stamps itself onto our souls. Most games with amazing worlds leave their effect on me because they give me a sense of wonder and awe, dreams of a universe that doesn't exist but one that I can get lost in. But in Cyberpunk's case, it gave me a world to get lost within myself. So while this game might not be the type of world for everyone, 
or even the type of game for a lot of people, there truly is a deeper beauty beneath it all that might just leave a bigger effect on you than anything else out there. Because I know it did for me. And maybe, just maybe, that's what the real goal of making worlds in video games should be all about anyways. It's not often that a game is made entirely around the idea of being the bad guys, but luckily for us, one of the games that did take this risk, Obsidian's underrated classic Tyranny, crafted a world unlike anything else out there. Tyranny takes place in a Bronze Age society that has been overrun by a fearsome leader referred to as Kairos. She has the power to cast what are known as edicts, which allow her to summon massive storms, earthquakes, and cataclysms that ravage entire regions and kill millions. And this has resulted in her taking over almost the entire known lands that the game takes place in, with you taking charge of a Fatebinder, one of her loyal servants who is tasked with helping to conquer the last remaining free region known as the Tears. So throughout the game you must slowly make your way from one area to the next on your journey to finally conquer these lands and what lies here. The genius of this game and its world though comes mostly from how it was designed. You see, Tyranny is a game that focuses on being wide rather than deep. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Where most games in this genre take well over 100 hours for just one playthrough, Tyranny only took me around 20 to 30. But that's because Tyranny is focused on the wideness, the aspect of choice and consequence. On one playthrough, you might ally yourself with just one faction that serves Kairos, and on another, you might actually side with the people of the Tears themselves, and tell Kairos and his servants like Tunon the Adjudicator that you were doing it to trick them all in the end. And each of these decisions results in massively different playthroughs, where you can travel to entire sections of the map and go through full quest lines that never show up on subsequent runs. This means to fully understand and experience all of the game, you have to go through multiple playthroughs to recover everything that it has to offer. And because of this, each of the decisions you make are a lot more than just set dressing. And throughout it all too, the commentary from this world takes it to the next level, because the tears are full of evil, sadness, and pain. At one point in the beginning of the game, you travel to one of Kairos' general's camps, and in the camp you can find soldiers tied to crosses near a fire. And when speaking to the people here, you learn that they're pleading for their lives, claiming they know nothing of the resurgent groups and the tears and their plans, but the general's men did not believe them, and instead ask that they kill one another to prove their allegiance to Kairos. And you can either sit back and watch as they tear each other to shreds, or try and intervene. Later, you can stumble upon beastmen who are being abused by the citizens of a small town, and decide to either get on the people's good side by helping torment the monsters, or do the right thing and try stepping in. But in each of the cases in the game like this, it isn't so black and white. As you learn more and more about all of the different tribes and functions of the Tears, as well as Kairos herself, you discover that true evil isn't what we usually see in movies. Rather, it's a sense of duty, of obligation to make a world better. And as you play more and more through the game, you discover that Kairos is not just simply some evil dictator out to kill everyone. She has given the people she's conquered more rights, more freedom, and by all accounts, better lives with more structure in society. But to reach these goals, she was willing to commit heinous acts with her power over the edicts. And only by going through your main quest and eventually discovering that you too have the power to cast these great edicts as well, can you fight back against the one power that Kairos always held. The power of true belief. Because it's with that power that real evil can be done, by forcing others to bend to your will only because they think they have to. And it's this journey going through this world and peeling back the layers to true evil and power like this that makes the world of tyranny so interesting. Multiple different areas and even mystical elements of ancient civilizations that originally built the great spires in the lands that power the edicts and their source. It's the type of world you can get utterly lost in should you let it. And even though the production values in tyranny are well below many other bigger and triple A games, it makes up for that by crafting a unique universe centered around power and how it can be created and held. All in a world full of massive sandstorms that affect the locals, ancient beasts and spirits that confide in the lands, and a lingering sense of finding hope in all of the hopelessness of finding power through inspiring belief in those around you, and learning that in order to fight and beat a god, you must become one yourself, and exactly how you can do that. The world has aspects of Roman and Greek mythology, of notable conquerors of history's past, but most of all, of a world that is beyond underrated and underappreciated nowadays. A place that could be home to countless stories and narratives about things that aren't often tackled in this medium. 
a world quite unlike anything else out there. Did you know that less than 5% of the ocean has been explored up to this point? It's been said that if we were to somehow travel to the deepest points of the Big Blue in the most secluded regions, we may just find creatures and beings the likes of which we never could have imagined. And that sense of wonder and horror alike is hard to escape. But luckily for us, Subnautica managed to capture it perfectly. It's a game built entirely around the idea of exploring the vast yet claustrophobic depths of the ocean, and is the perfect setting for crafting one of the most memorable game worlds out there. In Subnautica, you start out in shallow and lush waters, near where your spaceship crash landed on a mysterious planet, and it's your goal to slowly build better equipment and travel into deeper waters to figure out what's going on and how to escape. The key to this formula, though, is the exploration. Everywhere you go in Subnautica is full of new and interesting creatures and plant life, full of color and mystery, and the way in which you traverse this world is maybe the most interesting part. Since you're playing underwater for most of your playthrough, conserving oxygen is a key step to staying alive, and this means to travel deeper and deeper into the world, you must keep upgrading your character and their equipment and abilities in order to venture forth. And throughout it all, you can craft bases and set up markers for future places to go, and this is all spearheaded by an exploration system that focuses on player freedom. Unlike most open world games where you go to towns and get quests that lead you down specific paths, Subnautica focuses purely on the exploration aspect, where simply seeing something off in the distance that catches your eye is the catalyst for another great journey. And because the game takes place primarily underwater, the things you get to see and discover are unlike any other game out there, where in some of the darkest waters you can find creatures that make monsters in other games look like puppies. I still to this day remember my first time crafting the sea truck in game and finally venturing into the deeper waters that had eluded me before, turning on my headlights as the sea became darker and darker, as I slowly nudged my way past hordes of algae and strange looking fish only to discover caverns full of glowing crystals, massive underwater volcanoes, and leviathan-class monsters the size of my entire screen. And there's more moments like this even earlier on in the game too, like paddling through schools of fish as they scurry away from you in fear into small holes in the ground that you can then dive into, or even the slower moments like swimming into a part of the map you haven't seen before and finding another crashed ship from years before that went missing as well making your way through the structure and uncovering the secrets of what really went on, and reading the PDAs of people who tried to survive for years and the struggles and torture they went through in their final moments in this cursed ocean. It's things like this that make the world of Subnautica so special, because they all feel like your discovery. They aren't predetermined quests with a big payoff at the end, but rather you're just going out on your own adventure and discovering more of what the sea has to offer, as you slowly understand more and more about what's going on around you. More than most games out there too, Subnautica actually feels foreign. This isn't a setting that has lots of parallels to what we experience in our real lives, with towns full of NPCs and political strife that connects to the real world. It's a game that's fully focused on that thrill of exploring a place you don't even understand, about discovering the wonder and enigmas of a world that's a lot more fantastical than our own. To me, it's the type of exploration I wish more games had, because it really lights the fire in our imaginations to know what's out there, but this time in a setting that isn't space. Hearing the sounds of a massive sea monster ahead of you in the dark that you can't see as you slowly descend into the abyss of the ocean is an eerie feeling that almost no other game can capture. And the game flow of how you even move around these massive 3D spaces is just awesome, considering since you're underwater the traversal is much different than most standard games, even getting around in Subnautica is more fun than your typical walking around in other open worlds. And it also makes all the survival aspects of the game that much more enjoyable because it fits the setting so well. Trying to remain alive in a new world that you don't even understand is a lot more interesting in my opinion than just surviving in a scary forest. Subnautica is just one of those game worlds that comes together and creates something really special and unique where every little nook and cranny, and each new place you discover is a whole new experience that you can't get from any other game out there, or at least not in the same way. And that's because one of the most important things about a captivating world and games is a setting that feels fresh and unique, and considering no other game has managed to pull off underwater exploration like Subnautica, it surely takes the crown here.
There's very few game worlds quite as iconic as The Elder Scrolls, and that's because The Elder Scrolls games capture a whimsical and everlasting part within all of us, where we can be the heroes of a journey and travel to every mountain in the distance to our heart's desire. It's a series spanning over multiple decades now, and is home to some of the most engrossing world building, locations, and stories ever imagined. My first Elder Scrolls game, and still to this day my favorite by a good margin, is Oblivion. And just like all the other entries in this grand series, it captures a sense of awe and wonder that make these titles so popular even to this day. And that's because the magic of Elder Scrolls isn't the main quest lines or riveting dialogue, it's the walking. Walking around a babbling brook surrounded by a dense and cold forest, making your way over a hill and discovering a wide open valley full of lush vegetation. Stumbling upon a cave full of monsters and loot, and maybe even discovering some small stories along the way. The worlds of Elder Scrolls aren't designed to hold your hand, they're designed for you to make your own stories. Citizens and towns have routines they go through day and night, and homes they and families come back to at night, all of which you can break into and steal valuable items from, or even the lives of innocents themselves. And in each of these towns are hidden passageways to underground thieves guilds, wacky characters hiding secrets, and playgrounds for us to find our own fun. Throughout it all, Although, the biggest sense of magic in these games comes from the discovery, the bread and butter Elder Scrolls was built on in the first place, and the thing that makes Bethesda games so special. You see, Bethesda games have a sense of wonder that's kind of hard to explain. It's not something you can even put into words easily. The worlds they make especially and most prominently in Elder Scrolls case, excel at making the experience of it all the most important part. And the reason for me I remember the Elder Scrolls games so fondly, whether it be when I played as a kid or even nowadays when I load them back up with hundreds of mods, is the feelings they give me when I just explore through the world. Like when you first find Whiterun in Skyrim and the music kicks in as you walk your way across a sprawling landscape filled with places to go as far as the eye can see. You get that sense that you're here for the journey, not the destination, and that's a hard thing to pull off in games. A world that can utterly captivate you. It's interesting too because for the most part, I don't play Elder Scrolls games like I do other games. A lot of other open world games, I focus on main quests, characters, or trying to accomplish some goal that the game has given me. At every point on my playthrough of those games, the thing that pushes me to play more is a quest, or a character, or something the game is asking of me. But in Elder Scrolls, in Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim, the thing pushing me forward is that almost ephemeral sense of awe, of looking at a mountain in the distance and wondering if I can climb it, of noticing a hole in the floor that leads to a new adventure, of stumbling upon an entire ancient city built into the insides of a cave full of diaries and books about the lore and history of this ancient world. More than maybe any other single player game series out there, the world is everything in Elder Scrolls. It's the main character of the entire story. And because Bethesda focuses so much on the interactability in these worlds too, they become that much more believable. You can pick up every cup, sleep in every tavern, and experience a real day and night cycle that affects the world and its economy, culminating in an experience that feels alive and lived in. If your character gets caught stealing, for example, you could be thrown in jail, where all of your items will be confiscated, or you'll have to figure out a way to serve your sentence or escape. Characters react to what you do and have their own lives they live out in the game world, and it makes it feel like you're a part of something so much bigger. And while other game series have better narratives, writing, quest design, or characters, there's not one other game world out there that captures the sense of exploration like the Elder Scrolls series does. Where the most fun part you can have in any of the games isn't doing pre-made content, but rather just soaking up the world on offer and enjoying the moments that it throws at you. We already know that at some point we're going to be getting Elder Scrolls 6, and no matter where it's set or what it's about, I just hope that it can once again capture the magic that is in developed so many of us for decades now, and once again create a world that we can get lost in, even decades after release. Torment Tides of Numenera has one of the best worlds and games that you've never heard about. It takes place on Earth billions of years into the future, where nine great civilizations have risen and swiftly and mysteriously disappeared thereafter, leaving behind relics to their amazing and sophisticated technology that the now primitive humans still left on Earth, now called the Ninth World, must scavenge for and understand. You see, in Tides, you play as what is called a cast-off, one of but many conscious bodies shed from an evil genius called the Changing God. He transfers his 
his mind from one body to the next when he must escape danger, and the body left behind reawakens with its own thoughts and feelings. And so throughout the game you must uncover the truth behind your birth, as you slowly traverse some of the strangest and most unbelievable locations I've ever seen in fiction. You can talk to fanatical cults that eat the minds of people in order to maintain their memories, in what they see as a valiant effort to preserve the past. You can travel to an ancient space station orbiting the Earth with survivals from a strange race whose ship had to abandon them on the station, where they have now sat for thousands of years waiting for them to return, forging their own societies and police forces in the meantime. At one point you even find yourself in the gaping maws and insides of a massive interdimensional alien called the Bloom, which shoots its tendrils into different parts of space-time from which it can pull creatures and knowledge, something it can give you extensive thoughts on should you talk to it. And even the more mundane parts of the game are fantastical. The main area you play around in at the start of the game, Sagas Cliffs, is full of bright colors, wacky situations, and fantastic ideas that make you think. For example, one person you talk to is a levy, which is a being formed by taking one year of life from all Sagas Cliff residents in order for them to live in this protected area. These levies use this one year of life to then serve out on the police force until they eventually die, and are replaced by new citizens coming to this renowned area. But what if a levy was given a year from a man's life where he otherwise would have committed atrocities, becoming a serial killer? Well, that levy would be forced to deal with the immense guilt and sadness for acts it never actually committed. What would you do in that situation? And there's so many other moments like this in this game, and only in a world as strange and different as this one could they actually pull it off. Everyone you talk to almost sounds like they're going through a DMT trip, with confusing and meandering sentence structures and explanations. But as hard as it is to understand at first, if you give the game time and slowly read through all the unvoiced dialogue lines, you will be met with maybe the most interesting world in a video game I've ever seen. Another example of this is in the game there's a concept called mirror casters, which are devices that can look into the past of castoffs and see the world exactly as they saw. But the more interesting part is that once inside a mirror caster you can alter the course of the past, and take control of the host and not only figure out the secrets of their former self, but also direct the future of the cosmos and who they will become. This means in game you can use mirror casters to change the future and events of what characters in your party will be like, and some of the best moments in the entire game are traveling through these mirror casters and seeing the ancient past of hyper advanced technology from mysterious civilizations that controlled time and space before they disappeared forever. It's not for everyone for sure, the game feels very low budget with almost no voice acting, bad animations, horrible combat, and a UI that makes me want to tear my eyes out. But despite all of that, the core of this game, the world that's on offer here, one based on a tabletop game originally, is one of the most unique settings in science fiction and fantasy alike. The questions at the core of this experience only bring it to the next level as well, because just like the game it was inspired by, Planescape Torment, Tides of Numenera is a very psychological experience. Each of the areas you go to in the world are interesting to look at and even think about, but even more so it's the scenarios and questions the game poses to you that make it so memorable. Questions like what is the worth of one life? What would you do to know the truth? And what is real evil after all? The reason you probably haven't heard of Tides of Numenera and its world is because unlike many of the other games on this list, it actually isn't all that good of a video game, and as much as I love it, I would have a hard time recommending it to most anyone. But despite all of that, there is a world at the core of this game that begs to be analyzed, talked about, and understood. A world full of ancient secrets to uncover, hard to make decisions, and questions that will last with you for a lifetime. All surrounded by some of the coolest and most unique sci-fi concepts I have ever seen, some venturing into the macabre and terrifying depths of our own thoughts. Tides of Numenera is a world that honestly is very hard to get into. But once you do, once you actually give this game the time it deserves, it swallows you in captivation and refuses to spit you back out until you reach its conclusion. One of the best game worlds in the entire medium that I seldom hear anyone ever talk about. From Software are the creators behind some of the most important games of the past decade, Dark Souls, Sekiro, Elden Ring, and Armored Core. But the game that speaks to me the most is Bloodborne. And that's because Bloodborne, 
like its sibling games, has a world that you can get utterly lost in, but with its own scent and flair that are hauntingly beautiful. You see, Bloodborne takes place in a dark and mysterious society overrun with catastrophe and monstrosities alike, and you must fight your way past these horrors, or even run past them should you choose. But the real beauty of this game lies in its setting and the soul-stirring world. Each and every enemy you encounter can pose a real threat, and it's only by taking the time to truly understand their movesets and abilities that you can finally conquer their challenge. Too often games nowadays focus on making things accessible or easy, but FromSoft games like Bloodborne take the opposite approach, of making them painstakingly difficult. And this isn't just in terms of combat either, but rather the world too. Simply trying to understand what is going on around you is a feat of its own in this foreboding world, where talking with NPCs or uncovering tombs of the past reveal riddles and complexities that leave you with more questions than answers. However, throughout it all, the struggle, the pain, the challenge inherent in this game's setting makes the moments where you do conquer it all that much better. Like peeling back the layers of an onion until you slowly unravel the truth at its core, and come to realize that everything you have experienced was for a reason. When you walk down the streets of Yarnum, a Victorian era inspired fantasy city built on the souls of gothic intention, you can't help but take in the tragedy of it all. Whether it's the evocative music, the screams of people afflicted with the bloodborne disease that transforms them into horrific beasts, or the sound Sounds of bells ringing off in the distance. Every step you take in this game inspires a sense of dread. Every corner of this world is dark, damp, and quiet. Every monster is scary, but in their eyes you can see the crying souls of an innocent being inside wailing for help. It's the kind of world in a game that's depressing, but not in a bad way in a way that makes you think, that brings you deeper into the world, and makes it hard sometimes to push forward even when you can't help but get wrapped up in it all. And with each encounter you are able to regain life by being proactive and bringing the fight to the enemy, which is just another analogy to how you must travel through this world to survive. The brutality of it all, the unrelenting sadness and pain you must scavenge through to find even the most momentary times of solace. It's a sense of beauty that is seldom talked about, but certainly is captured in the world of Bloodborne. And for me, that's why it's one of the best game worlds that's ever been made. It may not always be the most fun, or even the most enjoyable at that, but it does leave an effect on you unlike many other things out there, where it's only through the hardship that you can find salvation, not to unlike our real world in many ways. And even though all FromSoft games have this eerie sense to them, something about Bloodborne is unique in that way, where you can fall so deeply in love with a place that tries so hard to make you hate it. Worlds and games don't always have to be happy or amusing. Sometimes it's by digging into those darker and harder to understand parts of our psyche that we start to understand more after all. And if there's one FromSoft game you should give a shot, and one that doesn't last for hundreds and hundreds of hours, it's this one. If only for the truly sinister world that etches itself into your mind. The world of The Witcher is one of the best and most realized in all of gaming. From the rolling vineyards of Toussaint to the icy mountains of Kaer Morhen, the continent is full of places to discover and stories to be told. And maybe more than most other fantasy games, The Witcher has a sense of grounded realism to it all that makes it a lot more believable and, in my opinion, more memorable too. My personal favorite game in the series is actually Thronebreaker, but I know for most people it's likely The Witcher 3. But regardless of what your personal beloved is, each of them houses such great worlds to get lost in. The politics of each game are at the center of what makes them so fun, and interacting with different world leaders and even townsfolk alike is where the most poignant moments of the series stem from. For one hour you might be roaming the countryside overlooking miles of open plains and dense and dark forests, and the next you could find yourself in a massive and unwieldy city full of chaos and life alike. In these cities are taverns with loud patrons, prostitutes and shady characters, and a world consumed by dark and mature themes that isn't afraid to tell gut-wrenching stories and tales that pull at your heartstrings. And behind all of this is a very rich and surprisingly complex set of fascinating lore. You see, in the universe of The Witcher, after an event called the Conjunction of the Spheres, different creatures and monsters from other dimensions poured into the world we play in. 
including most of humanity themselves from what was previously Earth. And this results in a fantasy world that feels similar to the tropes we know, but has so much of its own flair it can pull from, mixing and matching folk tales and stories told from a handful of civilizations in our own history. And this is also how magic came to be in the universe, along with many other mystical elements you can call upon. And really, I just love when fantasy games have good explanations for how things in their world really work. For as much as I love games like Skyrim, the magic and lore many times in that game doesn't actually make all that much sense the more you think about it, and the ramifications magic and powers would have on the world never seems to be accounted for. It's simply just a mechanic added to a game world to make it more fun. But in The Witcher, the backstory and thought put into the world make it all that much easier to dive into and get lost in. Because whether you have a question about how something might work, or even how society is structured based on its past, there's always an answer to dive into. And the Witcher universe also reminds me a lot of one of the other best worlds out there, that being Dragon Age. And for any of you curious, the only reason I didn't add Dragon Age to my list of best game worlds is because I think the Witcher actually has a ton of similarities, but it just does them in a way I personally like more. Like the Grey Wardens in Dragon Age versus the Witchers in the Witcher series. Extremely similar concepts with the same traditions, purpose, and histories, but I just like the way Witcher handled them better. And because the series isn't afraid to get extremely dark in its themes and questions it asks, it's the type of experience that leaves a much bigger mark on you. Even though science fiction refuses to stop being my favorite genre to play and worlds to experience, series like The Witcher and the worlds they've built in all of the games make me truly understand how fantasy is such a great setting too. Because at the heart of it all, what makes the world of The Witcher so fantastic is how well realized it is. How you can read for hours and hours about the wars and political strife between two factions in just one region. Or how you must prepare oils and enchantments to fight great monsters. How the man you bring throughout the entire story, Geralt, is one of the coolest and most badass protagonists ever put in this medium. It's a world that feels like it was crafted after decades of previous world building and thought. Because, well, it was, being a series based originally on a popular book franchise. And maybe more than anything else the Witcher games do that is great, it's the world and stories it tells that really last with us forever. And for me, it's what I like most about RPG greats like The Witcher 3. There are two types of people in life. Those that look to the past and are reminiscent of times long by gone, nostalgia junkies, and those that look to the future with excitement and joy, chads. For me, I'm firmly in the latter camp, and it's the reason so many of my favorite games of all time are recently released adventures, not the ones I played as a kid. But that doesn't mean there aren't some astounding older games too, and one of the things that some of these older games did so well was crafting a narrative and world you could get utterly encased in. Because what a lot of these older games lacked in modern gameplay, design, and flow, they made up for with crafting worlds that aroused pure imagination. And maybe one of the best examples of this is a now seldom talked about classic. Not Planescape Torment, not Pathologic, but Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura, which to this day is one of the most fascinating worlds ever put into a game. In Arcanum, you are thrust into a world very familiar to your standard Dungeons and Dragons romp, but this time in a universe that is on the verge of scientific revolution. There are steam engines, papers on philosophy and quantum phenomena, and many steampunk inspired landscapes with medieval set dressing. But the people you come across are more of what you would expect in a fantasy setting, with things like ogres, gnomes, elves, and woodland spirits. Almost no other games have settings quite like the one in Arcanum, and not only is it fascinating based on its uniqueness, but also the setting lends itself to telling lots of interesting and philosophy heavy stories. In fact, one of these is a very notable quest in the middle of the game where you are tasked with investigating with some of the locals about an underground breeding experiment and cult that is creating genetic monsters. But you discover by finding a hidden building on an empty island nearby that it isn't an experiment at all. Gnomes on the mainland have been kidnapping innocent females from their homes at night and bringing them to this massive facility. And in this dark dungeon, they are forcing them to breed with horrific monstrosities known as ogres, after which they take and raise half-ogre kin in order to be their loyal 
male slaves and bodyguards. Throughout the entire game up to this point, you saw many half-ogres protecting gnomes you would talk to, but only during this random side quest does the terrifying truth reveal itself, and it makes you think back on everything else you've already experienced in the game's world. And moments like this is what Arcanum is all about, slowly unraveling the mysteries in such a unique world that harkens back to fantasy we know and love, while also venturing into more scientific territory that usually we only find in grand sci-fi settings. The story told here is fascinating, like many other old RPG stories were as well, and more than anything, this is just one of those game worlds that is begging to come alive once again. And that's because I think there's more potential in universes that blend different genres and time periods together like this, and it's a shame that game worlds don't do this more often, especially because the template for an amazing world like this has been around for decades now with Arcanum, and it's truly the type of game world that begs for you to explore every core bit and read every little thing of lore. Another thing is that oftentimes games revolve around cool things that happened in the past, but maybe the most interesting things in Arcanum are the revolutions and political uprisings that are happening right as you play. It makes it feel like a much more dynamic world, where the best parts are imagining what will become of the place you're in that's about to change forever, instead of reminiscing about the past of this world and what already happened, or what will never happen in the future. Arcanum is just one of those great games of old that nowadays is a hard sell because of its dated mechanics and many issues, but the core of the world created here is the type of thing that could inspire so many for an eternity. What do you guys think is the most underrated game of all time? For me, it's Prey and more specifically, its DLC, Prey Mooncrash. And the reason for this is Prey crafted not only one of the most enthralling and enchanting sci-fi stories and worlds of all time, but it also focused on making that world immensely interactable and reactive, which is precisely why it's one of the most memorable game worlds ever made. In Prey, you start the game by waking up in what you think is your own apartment on Earth, and after a 30 minute intro sequence, you realize you actually have been living inside of a simulation on a massive space station orbiting our home planet the entire time. And it's from this point onward that you must start traveling around the station in search of what exactly is going on, to figure out why you are here and what has happened on this station now full of aliens and dead bodies. It's part system shock, part thief, part deus ex, all sprinkled with a little love from the Dishonored series, resulting in what I consider the greatest immersive sim ever made, my favorite genre of games personally, and the core reason for this is the world. Not only is each and every place you go to in this game full of lore and harrowing stories of what happened on this spaceship before you woke up and the experiments that have been taking place, all of which you'll piece together yourself, but on top of this, each room is meticulously designed to allow full player freedom and expression. You might see a terminal in a room behind a glass and steel enclosure that you can't get to, but even something small like this allows for so many possibilities in this world. You could hack through the door if your skill is high enough, you could break the glass and shoot a toy crossbow bolt at the terminal screen to click through the emails you want to read from afar, or you could even use alien powers you've garnered to turn into a small cup by mimicking objects around you and roll through a small opening in the enclosure to transform back into yourself and reach for the terminal and open the door. Agency and decision like this is what makes games so special, but the world of Prey only gets even more captivating when you take into account its DLC Mooncrash. Because Mooncrash takes this entire winning formula from the base game and turns it up to 100, with even more gadgets and more importantly, a time mechanic. You see, the goal of the DLC is to escape off a deserted moon base with five different characters all in one run, where every second you spend scavenging for resources and upgrades, the simulation you are going through with each character starts to corrupt and become more and more difficult with more powerful and numerous enemies. This means in order to beat the game, you need to not only discover five different ways to escape the moon, but you need to accomplish all of these in just one run before the simulation becomes too hard for you to beat. To do this, you need to plan out a route to get this done and figure out in what order you want to take your characters. And this only becomes more interesting because each character has their own special abilities in game and each run of the simulation can be completely different. On one run, you might notice the power is out on the station when you first start, meaning you are able to get through doors that are usually locked. But on another, when the power is on, you may need to bring the hacker character into the simulation early to try and unlock multiple doors for other characters
characters who will need to have them unlocked later in the simulation when it's much harder. You might notice a massive defense system that randomly spawns in the simulation on the run you're on, so you bring the mechanic as your second character to fix it and defend your future characters later in the run. And it's the on-the-fly decision-making and agency that makes Prey, and specifically Mooncrash, so amazing as a world. It reminds me a lot of The Outer Wilds with its own time mechanic, but I think the way Prey handles it is actually so much more interesting. Where instead of everything being pre-planned set pieces you discover for yourself, where you need to do things in a certain order and a certain time limit, rather, you have to actually come up with solutions to problems constantly as the game throws curveballs at you. It's a world that forces you to truly understand all of its mechanics and meaning for you to succeed, instead of just memorizing in what order you should do things. It also hits at the core of what makes the world of Prey so special, player freedom and staggering sci-fi thriller moments. And really, more than anything, what makes the world of Prey so special is that the world is the main character. The real power in this game doesn't come from leveling up or acquiring new abilities, it comes from your fundamental understanding of the universe and how it works, from both a lore and mechanical sense. The more you understand, the more powerful you come. And it's this type of power fantasy, in my humble opinion, that's the most satisfying you can have in a game world. And it's a big reason why I see Prey as having one of the best game worlds of all time, even when forgetting about the absolutely riveting sci-fi narrative with twists and turns that goes along with it. Assassin's Creed is now one of the longest running video game franchises out there, and to me, the biggest reason for this is the world. Each game takes us to new or previously visited locations and fleshes them out as much as possible based on history, art, and what would be fun for gameplay. But maybe the game in the series that crafted the most beautiful depiction of an ancient land of all is Assassin's Creed Origins, my personal favorite to this day. Origins takes place in ancient Egypt, and besides feudal Japan, this might be the coolest possible setting for an Assassin's game. But just having a cool setting doesn't make a good game. The location needs to be fleshed out, believable, and interesting to live in. And lo and behold, that's exactly what the world of Origins is. You can traverse endless miles of shifting sands and be taken by heat exhaustion and dehydration. Or you can walk through bustling towns full of traders and thieves that stalk the Nile River. Palm trees litter the lands, along with great pyramids and statues from these ancient peoples everywhere you go. Everything we fantasize and love about ancient Egypt is all here, with tombs and mysterious secrets to uncover. And overall, it's just a world that's honestly fun to simply walk around or ride around in. It's not often in games I just stop playing and sit back and take in everything around me. But in Assassin's Creed Origins, it's something that you find yourself constantly doing. Just being in utter awe at the world that's in front of you. Seeing a great structure in the distance and knowing you can not only travel all the way to it, but summit its peak to get an even greater view of the world. And ironically, I actually hate the open worlds of the Assassin's Creed games too, and Origins isn't any different. I find the quests uninspired and mundane, the world activities pointless, and scavenging for pointless treasure becomes boring after the first time, instead turning into something that makes me wonder why I would even waste my time on this series. It's the reason why for almost every other Assassin's Creed, I put it down immediately. They are beautiful, but they don't have depth or deeper meaning that make them worth playing. And while this is certainly the case for Origins in many ways, the beauty of this world specifically is just so great and grand that it makes up for it. The other games in the series are beautiful in their own way as well, especially Valhalla, but Origins really just captures a feeling unlike anything else. You know, I often hear people talk about how graphics and games don't matter and how the key is always gameplay and design. And while in general I find this to be true, I think sometimes a game's setting, art style, and graphics can be so good and so captivating that it creates a world you can get utterly lost in. Even if you don't actually enjoy playing it all that much, you can appreciate what else it has on offer. Sometimes all a world needs to be great is creating a place that just sweeps you up off your feet and you just love walking around and appreciating the beauty of it. And that's why for me, Assassin's Creed Origins, despite all of its faults, is still one of the most captivating game worlds out there. 
Red Dead Redemption is one of the best video game series of all time bar none. Not only is it crafted by the biggest name in games, Rockstar, but the worlds on display in each of the titles are some of the most well-realized and alive-feeling locations ever. I remember as a kid playing as John Marston, galloping my way across dust bowls and sprawling mountains alike. Or in the newest century, snow, forest, desert, and even more Mediterranean feels. And while there are so many things about the Red Dead series that make it special, whether it's the cowboy aesthetic, the NPCs with believable AI and interactions, or the fun shootouts and storytelling that hits a very emotional beat, to me the most memorable part of the series is scenes like this. Moments where you simply slow down and take in the breathtaking views. It's not often a game can make you feel like you really are going on a journey, one worth telling stories about and remembering. But that's what the Red Dead series is all about. Walking through your camp and listening to the hum of the cicadas buzzing around, the sizzle of the stew being made for that night's feast, and watching as the sun sets over a lonely canyon. And each and everything you do in these worlds has a western feel to it that's infectious. Oftentimes it plays like you were in a Tarantino movie, and that's on purpose, to capture an essence that isn't often explored in game worlds at all. You really do get to fulfill that fantasy of being a cowboy in a ruggedy old town that slings his pistol around. And on top of this, in these worlds there are characters full of life, darkness, and stories that will bring tears to your eyes. You really feel like you have a family, especially in the second game as you travel across old America and take in all the sights sights, sounds, and backwater towns it has to offer. It's a more bare bones world than one with spaceships and dragons, but that doesn't take anything away from the beauty of it all. Other worlds focus on taking us to far away places that don't exist, but Red Dead takes us to the one that existed not too long ago and shows us all the hardships, but also happiness we could have endured through those times. It's a homage to a past now long gone in a setting we won't ever actually get to experience in our real lives, but it was a vital part to a birth of an entire nation. And with this comes some of the best graphics, animations, and systems ever put into a video game. So if you want to feel just how powerful and captivating a world Rockstar Games is capable of creating, then look no further than Red Dead Redemption. One of the most beautiful worlds ever imagined in a game, where more than many others out there, it truly transports you into a new and believable place that for hours on end, you get to call home. You know, there are a lot of things that make games great, but too often we're focused on things like gameplay first and foremost, when really I think the things that make these experiences last in our hearts and souls forever is much deeper than just how it feels to play. The music, the characters, the story, and maybe most important of all, the worlds. The worlds that fully capture us and transport us somewhere completely new. And while today I spoke to places I found most captivating in games, I'd love to hear down below what you guys love as well. After all, different things speak to different kinds of people. And there were a lot of other games that deserve to be on a list like this, like Disco Elysium, Dragon Age, Bioshock, Nier Automata, Trials, Warhammer, and many more, but I had to stop at some point. And as always, if you want to support me and what I do here on this channel even more, make sure to check out the channel membership program and GOG affiliate links down below in the description. And thank you all so much for the love and support over this last year of my channel growing to now over 50,000 subscribers. It's crazy to see how far we've come in just one short little year. So I hope you all have a fantastic day, and as always, until next time.